Well, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Mr. Al Kearns. Uh, Coach Kearns is actually the director of the Ed Thomas Leadership Academies. He came to Parkersburg and coached with my dad, Ed Thomas, in 1978, and they worked together for over 30 plus years coaching football. Coach Kearns also established himself as one of the best track coaches in the state, coaching girls track for 29 years, where he won one state title and had four runner-up teams. Coach Kearns retired from teaching in 2014, was hired on uh, in a leadership role for us here at school. And I know each and every one of you are going to truly enjoy his message. And listen to what he says, take good notes, but please help me welcome Mr. Al Kearns. I want to thank you today for the people that are being here today. Um, thank you for people that are tuning in on the internet. Um, the first thing I'm going to tell you today, if you've ever heard me speak before, some of you might have, you're going to say, oh, he says this every time. Empathy and offense. I just feel like I have to say, talk about these two things every time before I start. And with things going on in the world today, I think it's ever more important. The word empathy, in, uh, when, as, as we you know, thought about things and setting up the Ed Thomas Legacy Leadership Academy for young people, um, I've found out in talking to young people, sometimes even high school students aren't really familiar with the word empathy. I think the word is more important than ever. To me, empathy is like mentally trading places with a person or a group of people. And then you have an appreciation for how they might feel. I'm not saying you know how they feel. Nobody ever knows how anyone else feels. But you have an appreciation for what might be going on or why they say the things they do or why they act like they act. Even though you may not agree with it, you can have an appreciation for it. I think we need this more than ever today. My when I first started to use the term empathy, I wanted young people to know this. I'm not talking to you today because I talk a lot about good character. When I was your age, I was kind of the opposite of good character and the things that I talk about and the things that I stress. So I'm not talking to you today because I'm this perfect person. I haven't been. Um, I started out with some poor character choices and it seems like you spend the rest of your life trying to catch up, and maybe you never do catch up. But the empathy is, if I were listening to me, I would look at me, this old man, and say, why do we have to listen to this funny-looking old man? I would have been very negative. Um, I don't think I would have been too receptive to too many of the ideas. That's my empathy. So when I set it up and I'm talking to the major part of the audience for the Ed Thomas Legacy Leadership Academy as young people, I have that empathy. I understand if, if you don't want to listen to me, but you're here because of some school or some obligation. I just hope in the end I give you something to think about, that you can make a choice. That's my empathy. I mentally trade places with you. And I think we're lacking empathy in our culture today. I look at things and the things that are going on, and, and everybody's aware that the last six months things have been kind of stressful for everybody. And some of the things that we get upset with people about, I think if we had more empathy, we would be a little better off. Offense just means this. And again, this is a heightened awareness right now. Offense, I, I don't want to offend anyone. Some of the things I talk about today, I feel very strongly about. They're very important to me. I got to tell you, I am a mutt, M-U-T-T, -T, a mutt. You're listening to me. This is going out on the World Wide Web. I'm no tech person. I don't understand all this stuff, but I know that's what they're going to do with it. So whoever could be listening, I don't know. I'm a mutt, meaning most of the people that, a lot of people that you hear that you listen to have degrees like a master's degree, a doctorate degree, something like that. I don't have that. I got my teaching degree. And most of the things I'm going to share with you, I've learned in the trenches, in working with young people. So, technically, it's unscientific, some of the things I'm telling you, because it's from my life experiences being an old man. But I feel strongly about them, and you have every right to disagree with me. So, I don't ever mean to offend anyone. If I offend you, you're taking it wrong. That's all I can tell you, because I would never want to do that. 
Yeah, my name's Al Kearns. I'm a teacher. I'm retired. I taught at Parkersburg and Appling and Parkersburg going way back to 1978. Um, I taught psychology, sociology. These are great examples. You talk about, you hear this statement today, well, let's follow the science. Well, subjects like so psychology and sociology are scientific studies in academics. They use the scientific method, but some of the, you know, it's not like, okay, this is the answer. There's only one answer and that's it. It's not like some of the things that you get in your education, like one plus one is two all the time. It's scientific, but it's not like that. So as we go, I taught a great character development and leadership course, a great one. Um, one of the highlights for me in my teaching career. I always went to the elementary school. I taught elementary gym my whole career for half a day at the elementary school. I did quite a bit of coaching, I guess. I coached football with Coach Ed Thomas and a lot of other great coaches and a lot of great, great young people. Um, I coached girls track for many years. And, and again there, I coached with a lot of great coaches and a lot of great, great young people. I go back in Iowa and no one probably remembers this but me, but I coached what they called six-on-six -six girls basketball back in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, my wife, I've had the same wife for 45 years because of her. And that's really something special to me. And again, when you say, Okay, I could offend somebody by saying this. There could be somebody out there that says, I, okay, so I'm talking about how much my marriage has meant to me. And somebody says, I don't want that lifestyle. Not everybody has to live that way. You don't have to have a wife. Okay, take it easy. I'm saying for me, what my marriage, we were blessed with two sons. We have two beautiful daughter-in-laws and five grandchildren. I just know how that makes me feel. I wish that for all you young people out there. But I know not everybody's going to make that choice, okay? I'm just saying. I work for the Ed Thomas Family Foundation now. I do a little bit of speaking, and I work at home. We live out in the country, and I stay pretty busy. I told you this at the beginning. I call this, if you were Kim to my high school class first day, I'd say, I want you to take a think every day you come in here. I want you to think, and I want you to think for yourself. I hope that if you would ask any former student that I had, what's the number one thing Mr. Kearns wants you to learn? I hope they would say he wants you to think for yourself. He wanted us to do that, to think for ourselves. And again, I think all the things that I've taught over the years going back and all the, some of the things that I'm showing you today that I believe in, to me, are more intensified today than ever in history, maybe, that you can think for yourself. I tell students, and I'm telling you, if you agree with everything I say, you may be an idiot. Now, when you teach for a while, you learn, you can't just say a statement like that to young people and then move on. Because some of them, you know, they're going to go home and their parents are going to say, hey, what did you learn today? Or what did you do in school today? And they say, I oh, don't Mr. Kearns called us all idiots. No. Think for yourself. That's not what I'm saying. I don't think anyone should agree with everything that anyone says. And today, I'm really not trying to tell you anything. I'm not just here to give you advice. It's not, I don't want to be like that. I want to tell you what I believe in, some things that I think will help you. And I know it's probably not for everyone. So, some of the things I say, I believe strongly, and maybe you have different ideas. And maybe it gets to the point where we disagree, where you disagree with me. Mr. Kearns, I tried to encourage that in my classroom. Somebody said, hey, Mr. Kearns, you said this, but I think this, and it's not the same. And I'm like, okay, game on, here we go. Let's discuss this. And the ending is probably the most important part of a disagreement. The ending of being able to disagree in an agreeable way. And again, talking about current events today, the last six months, you know, COVID-19, everything that's going on, all the stress in our life, it seems heightened to me that in this election year, we haven't done a very good job of teaching people to disagree in an agreeable way. 
I told you earlier, I'm in the 45th year of my marriage. That doesn't happen if you can't disagree in an agreeable way. My wife and I don't always disagree. Sometimes she's wrong. But we have to get along. We have to, you know, compromise or come to something. And sometimes, my wife and I are both probably type A people. We get excited. Sometimes we raise our voices like we shouldn't, but we do. But at the end of the day, it isn't very long, and it's like, okay, we got to get along here. That's what we do. And I think we need, teachers, we need to do a better job of teaching this. So we say, disagree in an agreeable way. I got this saying, and I, you know, I got it off the internet, I stole it, I don't know who to give credit to, but it says, I really like it. One of the truest signs of maturity is the ability to disagree with someone while still remaining respectful. To disagree with someone and still remain respectful. That's a very mature, important skill. And, you know, for relationships to last, for things to get done, to be accomplished, to reach goals of groups, people always have to work together. And that's a skill that we have to learn. Today I'm going to talk about what I call fundamentals And since this is a leadership academy, I'm going to say these are the fundamentals of leadership. Coach Thomas was all about fundamentals. He was one of those coaches. You know, if you don't like football and you don't like sports, don't just tune me out because it's life. It's life. In, In football, if he's coaching the offensive line, he wouldn't just say, block that person, block that guy. He'd say, this is how your stance starts when you start to do this. Everything starts with your stance. This is where your hands are. This is where your feet are. This is where your hips are. This is where your head is. Everything. Your first step to block this guy, your foot's this direction. You go, and here's your arms. And use those shoulder pads. They cost a lot of money. That's why you're wearing them. Everything was about the fundamentals. And the idea, one of his mantras, one of the things that he said over and over and over, If you take care of the little things, the big things will take care of themselves. And it's true in sports and it's true in life. Take care of those little things. You know, I want you to think for yourself and think how the world has been presented to you. Starting with your family. And what an impact they've had on your beliefs and your behaviors. And then you move to, you know, from your family being dominant up until probably the time you get in school. And then you get in school and your friends start being an influence on how you think and how you behave and how you talk. You know, I've got a part of a presentation that I use. I'm not going to go into it today, but part of it is, is how you talk determines how you think. How you think determines how you act. And how you act becomes who you are. And it starts with how you talk to yourself. That's a powerful thing. And where does that come from? You know, when you get to be in high school, I don't think there are too many parents that do this. I hope not. I don't think there are. I don't think too many parents would say, here, here's a hundred bucks. Life has been so stressful the last few months. I want you to take this $100 and I want you to go out and get some alcohol and have a good time. Maybe get some marijuana, smoke up. I I don't think too many parents say that, but I bet you can find friends that say that. Who do you listen to? Do you listen to your friends? Do you listen to your parents? Or who's talking to you more than anyone else? Do you listen to yourself? That's not, you know, because I think most of you out there, young people would go, okay, I got this voice. I know right from wrong. Do you listen to the right voice? So we go and we say, our friends influence is social media. I don't know much about social media. I would say I know zero about social media. But I know it's a huge impact on young people. It scares me. Um, The news. I used to be in the classroom, I would say, I encourage all of you to watch the news, to get involved. What's going on in the world? What's going on in our country? When that develops how you think, and you're going to be involved. Because we are what goes on in our country. We make powerful choices. So do that. 
Then later I said, okay, so you need to watch this news a little bit and this news a little bit because news started to have kind of agendas. They favored one side over another. So watch this one a little. Watch it. Think for yourself and decide because they're going to try to decide for you. The media is going to use, they're going to try to decide. There are people out there that want you to think a certain way and if you don't think for yourself, which we can do in this great free country, you're going to get stuck on one side. So we say the news, the school has a huge influence on what you're interested in, what you redo, maybe what kind of student you are, what kind of person you become. Um, you might have a job. All these things, all the groups, um, become types of peer pressure that influence how we think and act. We talk about peer pressure. A lot of times people say peer pressure like that's a negative thing. Peer pressure can be very positive. You just got to have be in the right group. And all groups that, that you get around in your life are going to do things and say things and try to get you to follow what their norms are. If they're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, they're going to try to get you to do that, not necessarily because they're mean, but that's the way people act. That's basic sociology. And those are the fundamentals of life, the little things. Things like your values, what's important to you, and your character traits and having good character. And in a little bit, we'll talk about your character traits. We'll talk about that word character and what, I guess, definition that I like about character because it's a really big definition. Think for yourself means you base your decisions on what you learn by looking at multiple schools of thought, by watching different news, by going from different to classroom, by listening to different teachers and joining different groups and all those different ideas, and then you choose, then you think for yourself, what do I want to do? What's the best way for me to go? What should I be doing? What should I not be doing? And all those groups that you choose to join as you go through life will influence your thinking, and they will influence your behavior. They will influence how you talk to yourself. So that's why I say thinking for yourself, that's leadership. When you think for yourself, that's leadership. If you came here and you're listening to learn something about leadership, I would say they start with this is self-leadership. And again, that group influence that I'm talking about is basic sociology. You first need to think for yourself. Self-leadership to pick those positive groups that you should be in. And, you know, so we say make your decisions based on what you learn in thinking for yourself. Don't make your decisions on how you feel or emotionally. And I think we can all had times in our life when we behave emotionally and our emotions get in control of our behavior and we say things and we do things that we might later forget. And hopefully we have enough courage to apologize for those mistakes. But... When, you, when we make decisions based on how we feel, sometimes it gets us in trouble. It's just like getting up in the morning. If you have an alarm clock and your alarm clock goes off, and you say, I don't want to get up. Now, young people do this, adults do this as well. I don't want to get up today. So you don't feel like getting up, but you've got to get up. You can't base that on how you feel at that moment. You have to know what you need to do in your life. Here's some important self-talk. How do you talk to yourself? Do you say, this is what I want to do today? Or do you say, this is what I need to do today? Self-talk. It's simple to understand. Sometimes it's hard to do. But you need to say, what do I need to do today? You need to get up. Your alarm went off. One of the worst things that ever happened was we have these new alarm clocks and they have snooze alarms on them. I hate those things. People keep hitting them. Get up! Get up! You set your alarm for a reason. When it goes off, get up. I need to get up. That's why you sent it. I need to get up. Get up. You have plans. You have goals for the day. Let's go. So we go, you know, base. Watch out for dogs, especially puppy, kittens. Um, watch out for children. Watch out for outrage. Watch out for po scientific polls and forms of propaganda. Because there's a lot of that out there in the media and in your social media. And people telling you things because they want you to behave a certain way. It could be political. 
It could also be a something as simple as a commercial for a product. And they want you to buy their product. And one of the best jobs in America, you know, pay-wise probably, is to work for an advertising company. That's pretty good. And they say, hey, I want to buy this because it has this logo on it. You could probably buy something else for less that would serve the purpose. I want to drive this make of car because it says something about me. I want my house to look like this because it says something about me. We're pretty good about that in our culture, and we live in a free country. We can do that. We can make those choices, but be aware. There's all kinds of devices out there that say um, home security, home defense. That's all great stuff. Don't get me wrong. But in your lifetime, you may give away more money than anyone could ever steal from you by buying stuff you want, not the stuff you need. But as long as you make that choice and think for yourself and understand, hey, I'm probably paying more for this than I would have to, then it's your choice. Disagree agreeably is leadership. To disagree in an agreeable way, that's leadership. Think for yourself, leadership. Disagree in an agreeable way, leadership. It has nothing to do with telling other people what to do. It has nothing to do with bossing other people around. It has everything to do with self-leadership, which is the basis of leadership. You can't lead others until you lead yourself. You know, to disagree in an agreeable way. we got to stop hating people because they think differently or act differently or we put them in some different group. we got to stop that. You see a lot of that today. It's causing us some problems. The basis of our country is that you have different sides, and it's like a marriage that, you know, if it's going to last, you have to disagree in an agreeable way. You might have to compromise. You might have to, you know, what's the goals of your group? How are we going to get there? Because this side feels this way and this side. How do we get that and still move ahead? You can do it, but evidently we haven't been teaching it too well. It's definitely a mature skill. And it's, again, it's a fundamental of relationship. If we look at our world today, that's a lot of question marks. I worry about what young people see in terms of people disagreeing in an agreeable way. Because I really believe that when I taught school for many, many years, all the teachers that I worked with tried to teach young people to get along. We can get along with one another with all the different ideas that come into a school building in one day. And hey, I taught at the elementary. I, taught re I had recess duty. I had noon recess duty, like many elementary teachers do. Everyone ought to try that sometime. Because little kids, they fight. It's important to them who the toughest kid out there is. They get in fights. you got to break them up. And when you break them up, Okay, we got to get along here, you know. That's part of the process of growing up. When you're kids, when you're young in recess, that's kind of a part of recess. And you learn, okay, you don't want to mess with this person. You kind of got to stay away from them. Where's my safe crowd? It's a lot like life. And if you choose to be in the wrong group, you can get hurt. And it all starts in kindergarten, if not before. So we're trying to teach young people to get along. We all have to work with people we don't like. And when I look at the top leadership that we have and people won't work together, I'm like, well, we have to. We're expected to. If we're teaching, we expect kids to. So we have to as well. We all have bosses that we don't like. You guys have teachers you don't like. You know, I don't know how many people are watching out there on the net, and I can't see you, but if I said, raise your hand if you ever had a teacher that you didn't like. You know anybody? We've got a few of you here. You ever have a teacher you didn't like? Raise your hand. Yeah, we didn't like you either. <laughs> no, that's not true. That's really not true in my case. I had kids that I didn't like the choices they made, but I can't think of hardly any kids that I didn't like. So we go and we say, that's, that's kind of a curse we have as a teacher. We like you. But we say, we have bought, we got to work with them. And if we look at our leadership today, if you, 
I think it's a great example. If you can't get along and you won't work together, nothing gets done. Nothing gets accomplished. There's no longevity. It's just conflict after conflict. It's a stalemate. It doesn't have to be that way. And that's what we used to call way back when I was your age, we used to call that being an adult. To take a think. I've got a saying here, and I'm a sayings guy. I love this saying. Now bear with me here. This saying goes like this. It's from Steve Sable. He has passed away in the last few years. Um, Him and his father were the ones that developed NFL films. He says, my father always used to say, treat everyone as a gentleman. Now you don't hear that term much anymore. Treat everyone as a gentleman. Not because they are a gentleman, because you are. Now think about that. First of all, don't come at me and say, oh, that's a sexist statement. It says gentleman, that's a sexist statement. Oh, time out. We're trying to learn something here. You have to have empathy. This is a guy's father talking to him as his son. Have some empathy. Okay, I understand why he said that word. He's talking to his son. We can look at it and go, if I'm teaching it, I'm going to go, my father always used to say, treat everyone as if they have good character. Not because they do have good character, because you have good character. To me, that's a powerful, powerful statement that we can all learn from. And then I, I should have written in here, okay, that's leadership. That's leadership. You didn't tell anyone what to do. You didn't per se lead a group. But that's leadership. You know, in our lives today, you're living in a time, if I went back to probably March, when the COVID thing started, or whatever they're calling it today, it's hard to keep up. We kept hearing these are unprecedented times. Unprecedented meaning it's never happened before. And we start to look at leadership because things got intense and they got really scary. And we look at leadership and we describe it as unprecedented. Now, I want you to think about this. In your life, when you're learning something new and it's never happened before, it could be a subject in school, it could be learning a new skill, you know, could be trying anything for your first time. Did you make mistakes? Because you've never experienced it before. Did you do things in your learning process and then you change your behaviors? Yes, it was unprecedented. Hindsight being 2020, we look back and we say, well, we should have done this and we should have done that. And yes, it's going to happen again. It's still happening. We can't expect perfection. How is that even possible? You know, we, we use words today like these difficult times, these challenging times, these trying times, these uncertain times. And it goes on. And I think this is what makes, you know, we talk about leadership. Times like this, your leadership shows up or it shows it's not happening. These things about self-leadership that I've been telling you about, I think this has intensified. Do you have it or not? You have to think for yourself and choose how you're going to respond to all these situations. And again, information changes. There's two sides to information. You have to think for yourself. Think about this. Here's the kind of people we are. We think we're the smartest things on the planet. And our first response, one of our initial responses as a country to COVID, was a toilet paper shortage. That was how we responded. Hello. Now, okay, that might be pretty important. Um... We're probably a toilet paper oriented culture, but that's for another time. But we say, that was our response. Is that the best we got? Fear. That's why it happens. Fear. You can't tell people don't be afraid. People are dying. Yeah, there's no question about that. You can't watch the news without seeing that stat. 
How many other people tested positive? How many people died today? How many people died totally? How many? I have empathy for you. Because when you're a young person, that has to be really scary. It's scary for an old guy like me. You're in the first quarter of your life. I'm in the fourth quarter. And I don't understand all of it. That's why I'm today I'm saying I'm not telling you anything. I'm encouraging you to think for yourself. You say, they tell you scary stuff. They say, you could get sick as a young person and not be very sick, but you could make someone else sick and they could die. And that's going to be my fault? I'm like, I got all this stuff going around in my head going, I don't know, what would you tell, what do you tell young people? I don't know. I grew up at a time where we were taught. You go to work every day, you go to school every day, you don't feel right, you don't feel good, too bad, go, suck it up. That's what you did, that was the American way. Those days are gone. And that's happened in what now, six months? That's a big change. There's a lot of changes happening. How many will be permanent? We don't know. There's lots of conflicting and ever-changing information. And that causes a loss of trust. That's why you have to think for yourself and make the best choices for you. For what it's worth. Now that was an old rock and roll song from back in the 1960s. And that was a time when I was high school age like you people. And this song stayed with me forever. There was a lot of turmoil during that time. You're probably unaware of it, but it was like there were a lot of protests. There was things going on, trying to make big changes. And man, there were mantras out there like sex, drugs, rock and roll. Wow, what a time to grow up. All right, I got to move on. But the words of this song went, there's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. That's what's happening again. Does history repeat itself? Those lyrics are so true today. As the song went on, this was another line that stayed with me forever. And I think sometimes that's what we're looking at, and that's why you have to think for yourself, and that's how you have to choose to respond, because there's battle lines being drawn. Nobody's right if everybody's wrong. And sometimes I think everybody's wrong. But we don't have to be wrong. Who do we look for? What groups do we join? Whose norms do we follow? That's leadership. Those are the fundamentals. I can't stress this enough. When things are going on today, when you feel like you're stressed, when you don't know what to do, sometimes, it used to be students might come to me and they might say, Mr. Kearns, we have this other class, and I don't learn anything, and the teacher's no good, and okay, on and on. And when they got done venting, I would say, what are you doing to make it better? You're standing here complaining. What are you doing to make it better? Well, that's not my job. That's a teacher's job. No, that's everybody's job. If you don't like what's going on there, you don't like it enough that you're complaining about it, what are you going to do to make it better? That's everybody's job. You're part of that group. I really believe that. And you say, is my response making it better? I fear that the United States, we have become excellent through the media and ourselves. We are excellent at being problem identifiers. We're really good at identifying the problem. We're supposed to be a country that's excellent at problem solving. And I want you to look at what's going on today, and I want you to ask yourself, if I were in that group and they're doing this, is that making the problem better? Or sometimes is it making the problem worse? Well, then behaviors need to change. We need more people to say, what am I doing to make it better? I think the problem's probably been identified. 
we need to sit down and disagree in an agreeable way. And that's the only way it will ever work. It's basic. It sounds, you know, I could tell this to middle school or earlier. I believe in it strongly. I don't think it's going to change. It sounds simple. It's not simple to do, but I think it's what we need to do. Young people, if you get feeling stressed in all these times, leadership is say, what are you doing to make your stress level better? You know, if you heard um, Lindsay talk, or I don't know how they're going to line this up, but one of our other speakers in this academy talks about something as simple as taking a walk, doing some exercise, doing something, read a book, whatever makes you relax, take some time to do that every day. It's kind of like in psychology class, I used to say sometimes stress is like, if I had a paper clip here and I put it on my head, could I really feel it? Probably not that much, but if I, if I don't get it off, and I keep putting paper clips on, and they would get so heavily, you know, heavy eventually that they would crush my skull. You gotta get them off. You gotta get rid of the stress in a way that works for you. That's leadership. If you wanna help yourself, help somebody out. Sometimes when you're feeling stressed, I learned, I learned early in my coaching career, I would say, we got a game tonight, are you ready for the game or whatever? Ready for the track meet? And I had so many kids say, Mr. Kearns, Mr. Kearns, I'm so nervous. I'm th Something that, was, that I always thought was so fun, I so looked forward to it when I had that opportunity, I couldn't imagine some saying, uh, I'm so nervous, it was so stressful for them. But I found out a lot of young people feel that way. I never felt that way, but a lot more people did than I ever imagined. So we started talking about how do you get rid of that? And part of it was like this. I didn't make this up either. I stole it, but it's pretty good. I said, turn your M upside down. And they said, what? I said, turn your M upside down. And what I meant was, the M in me, turn it upside down so it says we. Your stress all comes from, and our culture lends itself to this a little bit today, to be an opera singer and go, me, 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 me. I can't sing, but me, 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 me. What about me? You're not nearly as nervous when you say we. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. I'm looking forward to getting up. I'm going to help the team. I'm going to help our group. I'm going to help us. If you want to help yourself, help somebody else. And it might just be something in school to where you might say, you know what, at lunch... I always see this person sitting by themselves. Maybe you help somebody else. So, but hi, how you doing? Maybe you sit down across from them. Maybe they don't talk to you day one. You try to talk to them, maybe they don't talk. You give up. Help somebody else. I guarantee you, you'll feel better. You know, this Leadership Academy... There's many leadership academies. They have them in every state. I don't know how many possibly there could be. We ask ourselves questions like this. Is ours the best? And maybe that's not a good question, but we think things like, hey, one of these leadership academies is going to be the best one ever. Why not us? Unless at least do the best we can. In the end, I'm pretty sure all leadership academies want to be the best and want to be the same, you know, they want the same results, the same things. We want you to think about your exits. Think about your exit today. You have the opportunity from some speakers today to learn some things, and when you tune out, when you shut down this presentation, when you leave this room today, are you going to be better than when you came in? Because you have that opportunity. That's what it's all about. When you log off today, will you be better? I call that G-bed, get better every day. That's one thing I learned right away with Mr. Thomas. In life, if you can learn to get better every day. Imagine if you went in every classroom and you focused. This, would, this is also leadership, and it says nothing about anyone else, but you go in the classroom, you say, when I leave the, this classroom today, I'm going to be smarter than when I came in. And if you have four or five, six classes a day, 
That's really powerful. I know in athletics, the best teams were groups that understood. If we come to practice for 30 minutes or an hour or two hours, and when we leave, if we're better than what we came, when groups are mature enough to understand that, those are the teams that become really hard to beat because they don't waste a day. They don't go backwards. They're always moving forward. Now, we taught this, and I think about myself. Teachers out there, are you a better teacher on Wednesday than you were on Tuesday? Because we're teaching this. We're asking young people to do this. Is this how we live our lives? Do we try to be a better teacher on Wednesday than we were on Tuesday? Why not? And I had a teacher once, hey, yeah, well, you're going to teach for 40 years. You can't get better every day for 40 years. You can't do it. No, but you can have that attitude, right? You can have that attitude. And probably most days you will get better. You certainly won't reach a point of frustration where you go backwards. Get better every day. That's a powerful thing. Think about all of your exits that you have opportunities to get better in a day for each class, each practice. At the total end of the day, evaluate your day. Did you learn? Did you get better? Were you better than you were the day before? You know, and again, I'm in the fourth quarter of my life. You're not. I am. Once in a while, I think about my final exits coming up. Did I leave things better than I found them? I don't know. But I'm trying. And we're trying to live up to this standard set by Ed Thomas to impact young people in a profound and positive way. That's what we're trying to do here. And it's easy when you're here, it's easy when you're listening out there to think good things, to make good choices, but your test comes when you leave, when you exit here. What kind of choices you're going to make? What kind of person are you going to be? And our theory, kind of, with our Leadership Academy, is that some of you young people listening here are going to go out and you're going to make it big. You're going to have influential positions. You're going to have leadership roles in your life. Now, one of the biggest leadership roles you'll have, no matter if it's in business or politics or whatever you do, all of you, many of you, most of you, your most important job you'll have in your life is being someone's mother or father. What greater leadership role could there be? I've had young people say, Mr. Kearns, I don't want anything. I don't want to be a leader. I don't want to be... Hey, do you want to have a family someday? Yeah, do you want to have children someday? Well, yeah, then you better be a positive leader. You better be a positive role model. Schools everywhere are looking for that positive student leadership. Before this COVID thing, we would open up registration, this room would be packed, and we'd be turning schools away. We wouldn't have to put this out on the World Wide Web or whatever you call it today. In the spirit of Ed Thomas, we care about all these things that I'm talking to you about. We care about you. All the people listening out there, we care about you. We don't even know you. That's kind of a curse that teachers and coaches have. We do care about you. And even if you don't care about us, we care about you. And for me, it starts with, you know, the people in our school, people in Iowa, young people. It's important to us. And that spirit of caring is the basis of this Ed Thomas Legacy Leadership Academy. And today, as you listen to speakers or do activities or whatever your teachers have you do, we hope that it's a positive and a great experience. All your schools out there have a dominant form of leadership, and you break it down as easy as you Your school either has positive or negative leadership. What type of leadership dominates your school? I don't know, but you know. If it's not positive and you know it, what do you ask yourself? What am I doing to make it better? You know, you... Every time you complain about something, complaining is kind of contagious, sometimes it's even kind of fun, but when you're complaining, ask yourself, what am I doing to make it better? I'm complaining about this. Are you doing anything to make it better? Wow. 
Well, then maybe you should just be quiet. Positive leadership is leadership with character. Leadership without character is a failure of leadership. Leadership without character is a failure of leadership. That comes straight from our character development and leadership curriculum that we use at this school. Character and leadership equal success. The combination to me is a common sense approach, a fundamental of what groups are looking for. Now, let's say you want to join the Tiddlywinks team at your school. And you want to be a really good Tiddlywinks player. You have to understand that you're going to have to put in hours of practice more than others. You probably want to understand the rules of the game of Tiddlywinks better than others, the strategies. You're probably might be helped by understanding history, listening to your tiddlywinks coach. But something else you don't want to miss. If you improve your character, you'll become a better tiddlywinks player, and better than that, you'll become better at whatever you do in your life by improving your character. Trust me, I know it's true. I've lived it going from bad character to good character, and seeing in one man's life what change in your character from bad to good can do. You become a better husband, you become a better father, you become a better teacher, you become a better role model, you become a better person. And one of the things I first learned with Coach Thomas as well is that he taught character when he taught everything. He taught good character when he taught. He just called it, do what's right. Fellas, do what's right. Make good choices. And in, back in the old days, we didn't call it good character like you would now, but that's what he was talking about. And I saw early in my career that when young men improved their characters, they became better football players. So don't miss that. If you want to improve in something, improve your character, you will get better at it, I promise. You know, rule number one of leadership, maybe it's not rule number one, but it's up there. There's no such thing as individual accomplishment. Anything that you accomplish in your life, you probably should look at someone and show appreciation for it. I mean, it could be something as simple as this. The things that you feel stress about today, should you go to school, should you not go to school? Could going to school make me sick? Could I make someone else sick? Your teachers are going through the same thing. And I know they appreciate you being here, I hope they tell you, but you should also tell them, I appreciate you being. What about the janitor that has to clean up all the unthinkable messes? Do you think they worry about getting COVID from all the people they have to walk behind and pick up stuff? You name it. You ever say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Janitor, thank you. I appreciate what you do. Everybody's doing their job. Everybody has the same thoughts. Everybody has the same fears. How you respond, how you choose to respond by thinking for yourself. You know, and always, if you want to improve the performance in your life, in every area of your life, improve your character. Now, I have some more stuff down here. This is one of the favorite pictures of my life, and this is the definition of character, how we call character that centerpiece word, and how we look at all the character traits around it. And again, this is from the course that we teach in our school. You could put other words in here, but I wanted young people to know that if I wrote them a resume and I said, this young person has the highest character qualities, that's the best compliment you could get from me. Because when I say that, it means you're pretty good at all these things like attitude, preparation, perseverance, respect, honesty, integrity, compassion, composure, perseverance, tolerance. You're pretty good at those things. Some of them come easier than others. Some of them are difficult. I could say, here's the word composure. That's really difficult for me. 
really difficult. I can, I can get excited really. I could be a road rage guy. That would be easy for me, but you can't do those things. Someone could say something to me. I can get upset and I can come right back at you. You got a problem? What are you looking at me for? I can do that. It's idiotic. Some character traits we have to look at remaining, gain our composure, all these things. So we say there's character, the centerpiece word means you're pretty good at all these things. And you have to look at those character traits. Now, we also say character first, leadership second. Character first, leadership second. If you take these fundamentals of your behavior and thinking for yourself and disagreeing in agreeable ways, that's when leadership follows. Because when you do this, when you make good character choices and you think about words like that and you think about all the character traits that a human can have and how you behave in those situations, then leadership follows. And again, leadership without character is a failure of leadership. But once you can do this, you become a leader and you might not even know it. The role models in your school, sometimes kids that other kids look at for doing positive things, they don't even know they're leaders. They're just trying to do what's right and working hard every day and living. That's the way they live because they've made these choices. So, again, character first, leadership second. Now these are the fundamentals of leadership that I think. You may disagree with me, said that early on, but I really feel strongly about this and I hope I've given you something to think about. Now as always, I over-prepare a little bit so I have more stuff here. The late great coach Thomas was a role model of leadership. And I'm just going to put up a couple slides here for you. I'm running out of time. But I'm going to put up a couple slides of what I stole from him or what I learned from him about leadership. And if there's any teachers tuning in out there or people, you'll be able to get these things. And if you want to use them for discussion or have any questions, you can get a hold of me. But these are the things I stole from Coach Thomas. And things like, you know, consistency. When you're a leader, you don't have a lot of drama in your life when you're with your groups you're leading. Every day he came, we knew what to expect. Every day he came, it was consistent. You knew he was going to be excited. You knew he was going to be positive. You knew he was going to be intense. You know, Talk about great vision. Talk about not being critical. You know, what do we need to do to fix it? And one of the best things I learned from him was looking at ourselves first. I remember early in the coaching career, we lost a game. And I hear some coaches today say things like, these kids today, they don't know, they didn't do what we told them. And, and he, you know, I could have been like that, but I remember him telling me after the first game we lost, he said, hey, we have to do a better job of coaching next week starts with us you know uh, role model um, talking about doing what's right and how to prioritize your life talked about ethical dilemmas and making life choices and, and when you know your values it's easier to make your choices um, and again not a lot of drama and all these things were stuff that I stole from him that really helped me with leadership and he was a great role model for him, and everybody that he was around understood these things. So with that, I'll close today. And the things I want you to take a think about again, thinking for yourself and make good choices so you don't have to look back on any portion of your life and say, woulda, shoulda, coulda. You don't want to have to say, woulda, shoulda, coulda. You don't want to have to say, I wish I would have done this, I should have done that, or I could have done that. Think for yourself and make good choices along the way. Learn to disagree with others in an agreeable way. When you find yourself complaining, ask yourself, what am I doing to make it better? If you don't like what's going on, what are you doing to make it better? Evaluate what you're doing and is it making it better or worse? Once the problem is identified, 
stop identifying and start looking for a solution. Choose to live. Choose to live with character, people. Live with character. That's leadership. Thank you, Al Kearns. It's been fun.